Okay, and we are live. And I just, there. I have an annoying thing that jumps up on my computer from time to time telling me I need updates. <laughs> so I just had to get rid of that. Um, I want to welcome everybody to the uh, March meeting of the Lake Erie Region Source Protection Committee. Um, at the moment, we don't quite have a quorum yet, so we're going to uh, start with the items that are for information and come back and um, hopefully we'll have a quorum um, by the time we, we get to the um, reports that we do need to make some decisions on. Um, Ilona, could you do the roll call, please? Certainly. Alan Dill? Present. Larry Davis is absent. Linda Dixon? Present. Amy Domaratsky? Present. Paul Emerson? Present. Andrew Henry? Present. Eric Hodgins. Present. I have Ken Hunsberger, Kathy Jamison, and those two are absent. Um, Matthew Yarne. Present. Jim Kirchin. He was there, and I think he was trying to come back in, so I think he's just maybe having computer problems. He was in his present. Ian McDonald. Here. And we have Andrew Henry, um, proxy for Lloyd Perrin. Still here. Yep. Peter Ryder. Here. George Schneider. Here. John Spoulis. Present. Bill Strauss. Here. And we have Ryan Taylor, Bill Unger, Brian Whitwell are both absent. Bill Wilson. Here. And that's everybody. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Ilona. Since our last meeting, um, I've attended a couple of meetings um, for the Guelph, Guelph Aramosa water quantity policies. And most of the things that I've, I've been doing um, are also things that have involved Martin or are, or are here on the agenda. So uh, we did have a meeting uh, with the chairs province-wide in December, and a lot of the things are in Martin's report. And um, I was gonna highlight the um, importance of sending a proxy. And I think this meeting is making it even more evident that we really do need to follow up. We, when we set up the original terms of reference, there was a concern, especially with traveling and winter weather, that uh, we would need to use proxies. And um, it's, it's a really good tool to ensure that we do have a quorum for the committee meetings. So those would be my remarks for today. Um, reviewing the agenda. Are there any additions or revisions you'd like to raise? Otherwise, could I have a motion? Um, Andrew. Paul, Andrew Henry and Paul Emerson to um, approve the ad agenda as distributed. All in favor? In favor. Thank you, Bill. Opposed, if any? Seeing none, it's carried unanimously. Um, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. The minutes of the previous meeting, perhaps we should wait um, on that item. That's a question for Martin or Ilona. Um. Can you repeat the question, please? Um, can we pass a motion to um, approve the minutes or should we wait? Uh, well, we can't approve anything right now. Okay, all right. 
then um, I guess there are no delegations uh, and there's no presentations. There are three items of correspondence on the agenda and I, we could entertain it questions. the agenda and voted. Pardon? Pardon, Ilona? Whoever said. I'm not sure who spoke and asked a question. We've got the correspondence. Um, on the agenda. Are there any questions relating to the correspondence? I'm okay Moving. with them. Thanks, Bill. Moving then to the uh, first report, uh, Martin, uh, the Source Protection Program update. Uh, thank you, Wendy. Um, just to, to clarify, um, we, we, right now we're not having quorum, we can't pass any motions. We right. have to wait to do that. Um, we can have, an inf essentially this is an informal meeting. It's not, uh, this is not uh, according, like we, we don't have to, we, can, we can't, um, yeah, um, pass any resolutions or, or make decisions. Um, I, I do suggest, but I guess it's up to you, Wendy, I do suggest that we continue to provide the information that is in the agenda, but we will, if we not have quorum, we'll have to um, essentially come back to uh, at another meeting uh, to, to make those decisions. For the annual reporting, which is essentially the decisions we need to make with respect to submitting the annual reports to the, to the province, um, that is due by May the 1st, so we do have a little bit of time but it would mean that we have to uh, reconvene um, and, and then through uh, with a, you know with quorum be able to um, to uh, pass those resolutions to submit. Um, the the one challenge we have is that uh, Long Point Region Source Protection Authority Board meeting is April the sixth next Wednesday. Uh, their agenda is going out tomorrow, um, so that may not be possible for us to uh, bring it to the authority board in time for meeting the May 1st deadline, because obviously their next meeting is in, in May then. Um, okay. But that's, um, well, that's just the, re the reality. Um, but I guess the question right now is first, do we continue as a, um, just an informal meeting to provide the information to the members that are present? Um, or do we essentially adjourn and reconvene at another date? Or do we do it by? I don't have um, any thoughts from the committee. In the last meeting, we yeah, we uh, Andrew, Andrew um, just mentioned that. I mean, we did at the last meeting um, pass resolutions via email. It is something <laughs> that we did. We could do that again. It is not necessarily something that is that is specifically. Um, mentioned or uh, it's not, not not allowed, but it's not also, uh, you know, it's not specifically identified in the rules of procedure of, of how to do it. Um, it is an option. Um, again, it's not necessarily the way that the rules of procedures are, are written. Um, so yeah, it's up, up to you, Wendy, whether you think that's still gonna be, um, you know, correct. Yeah. Paul Emerson had a question yeah. and so did Andrew. Go ahead, uh, Paul. Okay, thanks very much, Wendy. I would, I would suggest we just move ahead. We're only two people short, you know, 15 or more people plus the staff have made an effort to be here. Let's just do it and then do the email approach to ratifying things. That's what I would say. Anyway. Okay, Andrew. I was, I, I'm basically the same, uh, the same idea. The, um, if there's a significant number of uh, presentations though associated with even these information reports, uh, I'm assuming there's still value if we proceed today. Um, are, are, so are we talking about trying to, uh, 
do the mandatory approvals via email or are we going to schedule a brief meeting of the committee uh, in April in order to meet the May deadline? I, we've got a problem um, with the sound. Martin, um, I see Larry Davis is trying to come in. Um, We're one person better, yes, that's good. That's very good. Um, Somebody, uh, Peter Ryder, you had your hand up as well, did you not? Uh, yes, I did, but uh, I think it might be a good idea to just continue on and, and do whatever needs to be done by email, just given the time and the commitments we've made today for this meeting. Is that then the consensus of the committee? I see some other heads nodding. Is there anyone um, who wishes to think otherwise? Lots of thumbs up. So. I think then what we'll do is go ahead um, and uh, then follow up with emails um, for confirming the resolutions. I don't know whether, Martin, we want to pass them with the, um, with the mover and seconder and then have those confirmed later. Uh, yes, we can do that. Okay, well, let's do that. So then um, I'll back up a little bit and go back to the minutes. I didn't hear anyone say they didn't want to do this approach. So I, I really appreciate going forward because I think it'd be a shame to have to sit through um, the same meeting twice for those of us who've been able to attend. And um, hopefully the balance of the committee members have, um, or will have read the agenda so we can get a proper quorum for passing the resolutions via email. So going back to the minutes, um, any questions or comments on the minutes? Bill Stroh's here. I will uh, move the, that they be accepted. Thank you, as Bill. Printed. Thank you, a seconder? Seconded. Jim Kirchen. Um, all in favor? Opposed, if any. Thank you very much. For those of you who don't have your video on, um, I'm, ass I'm assuming unless you speak up that um, you're voting in favor. Moving on to the correspondence, there are three items of correspondence. Can I have um, a mover and a seconder? to receive those for information. Uh, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Seconder. Bill Strauss. Thank you, Bill. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried unanimously, thank you. Martin, I think you're up next with your um, source protection program update. Thank you, Wendy. Oh, that doesn't work. I need to. Yeah, okay, that's better. Yeah, we unmuted the, the wrong <laughs> and you get feedback. So that thing, I think this is better. Um, so here we go. I'm just going to have to go down to my meeting here. I do like to um, highlight a few items from the report. The uh, first one is with regards to the phase two changes to the director of technical rules. They've come out uh, in on December, early December, and we are now working together with the in, uh, implementation working group, as well as individually with municipal staff to figure out impacts and how we move forward. Uh, we're scheduling a specific uh, working group session on April the 13th, uh, devoted to the technical rules uh, alone so we can work through the, the details and figure out how, how uh, they are uh, municipalities and, and us collectively, how we are affected by those changes. Uh, I'd like to say for the kettle and catfish, the, for the smaller plans, very straightforward. And we've included the, any updates in the section 36 uh, plan updates. 
or long point in the Grand River plans, not as surprisingly, uh, it's going to be much more involved with much more time and effort needed to figure out uh, priorities, how it's affected, and how we move forward. It's likely going to be a multi-year process. Uh, some items may be prioritized and we can include in the Section 34 update. Others may have to wait for Section 36 down the road in a few years. So this is a, um, for, the, for the larger plans, it's a much more involved process and we will bring forward um, our kind of collective uh, work plan in a future meeting to the committee. So you can get an understanding of where we're heading with this as well. Um, some, of, some of the rules are enabling. So we need to be able to uh, prioritize at the local level to figure out what is needed and what can wait. Um, some rules do um, have consequences in the, in, in the sense that they would, uh, once implemented, would uh, identify more uh, numbers of significant threats. So it has implementation um, um, impacts, I guess, and then others uh, are simply just um, clarifications and, and need to be adapted if there's new wells and new systems that come on board. Um, so um, how we move forward and we'll bring an update uh, to the committee later on. Um, on the best practices guide, very similarly, the ministry uh, released the, 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 that's a guide, essentially a, a web book. It's a, it's a website. Uh, it, we can be, it can be printed out, but it's essentially um, uh, multitudes of websites that are linked with resources and information uh, regarding how systems, whether it's a private system or a communal system that are not covered under the Clean Water Act, how they could be protected and how source protection could be undertaken outside the Clean Water Act. Um, I would like to kind of just highlight that we do feel uh, from a Lake Erie perspective, a staff perspective, that uh, there's uh, detailed information and helpful technical resources and links that help with assessing vulnerability and identifying risks. Uh, there's practical uh, solutions or, or suggestions on how and what communities and private landowners can do on their own properties. Um, kind of limit it because unless you have Martin, you've cut out. We can't can hear you. Hear you. Yeah. Okay, I'll I'll do I need to go back a bit? Um so the the guide is good in providing education and, and technical information on assessments. But because it doesn't, it's, it's on a voluntary basis, it doesn't allow for the Clean Water Act tools to be used beyond the, the boundaries of the property that, uh, that the well is on. And, and that is obviously a limitation that, um, well, was identified in the first place in, when, when the Clean Water Act was established, and that's why we have it. Um, of course, um, there is, uh, it's not a, a a straightforward exercise and it's certainly not not easy to to change the clean water act but uh, from what we understand that the ministry is looking into options as well on how how that could be moved forward so as a first step we welcome this this practical guide or best practices guide uh, but we would um, from a staff level would uh, support the ministry in looking at how some of the um avenues and tools that are available in, under the Clean Water Act could be expanded or extended to uh, other systems. Uh, so it wouldn't be um, as much of a, a comprehensive assessment that we need to do for municipal systems, but possibly some kind of what I call Clean Water Act light approach uh, to some of those other, other systems. Uh, obviously down the road, um, those are those are discussions that I'd like to still have with the with the province and and, and hear from them in, in terms of where they may be going. Uh, moving on to the ministry workshop on road salt use and management in Ontario. Um, this was uh, it's an initiative by the ministry uh, on its uh, on a broader scale. It's not just a source protection initiative. Um, we received invitations uh, both at the program managers level as well as the CAO with general manager level at each of the conservation authorities. A number of municipalities have been involved and, and invited as well. 
Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend uh, myself, but from what I understand, it was a lively and uh, engaged discussion. Um, from what you see in the appendix uh, that I that we uh, appended here, that the road salt background that the ministry um, circulated, their approach currently is the promotion of best management practices, which, um, from what I understand, most participants that, uh, that were discussing at those workshops probably would have been welcoming as a first step, uh, but also commented that really the recommendations to strengthening the training programs and certifications for contractors, and most importantly, the need to address liability concerns are really to be tackled by the uh, province. Uh, without that, the promotion of best practices may not really move the needle much with respect to uh, those impacts from road salt and, and the impacts that we're seeing on, on municipal drinking water systems. Um, and I think I have a link in, uh, as you will remember, in December 2019, there was a fulsome report presented to the committee on the Lake Erie region's comments about and, and perspectives and recommendations to the province with regard to how to move forward. And that certainly included the training programs and certifications and, and addressing liability concerns. Uh, it's not something that is that needs to be, uh, the wheel doesn't need to be reinvented. Uh, there are um, jurisdictions uh, south of the border, as well as in other, other parts of the, uh, the world that have tackled those issues. Um, so certainly it's something that, that should be looked at in more detail on how Ontario can move forward. Um, a quick update just on the Conservation Authorities Act phase two regulation that um, phase two was dealing with the municipal levy uh, portion of how the new framework would, would work. And there is a specific aspect in it that re respecting source protection, specifically how the funding mechanism would work if and when the province would reduce or eliminate the provincial funding for this program. Um, so the mechanisms with this phase two regulation in, in part two, the, the province has put in the final uh, components of that, that funding mechanism um, to essentially be uh, for conservation uh, authorities to levy municipalities for program costs for source protection. As we know currently, uh, there is um, provincial funding for the program. And I actually just, uh, I can let you know that we just recently received a draft uh, agreement from the province. So we have committed funding for the next, well, we don't have the signature yet, but <laughs> we have committed funding from the province for the next two years uh, until March, 2024. Um, but obviously we don't necessarily know what uh, changes will come down the, down the road. Um, the specific mechanisms on how this would work for, uh, as you may recall, levy funding specific, uh, typically is only um, applicable for participating municipalities in the watershed of each of the CAs. Um, the regulation does talk about specified municipalities and how they could be used to um, levy municipalities beyond the watershed, uh, but the, pro the, the process is fairly cumbersome um, and would really we would still have to figure out exactly how it would work. Um, and that's, I guess, something that we still have to, to, to work through. Um, moving on with uh, Guelph, Gulf Formosa Water Quality Policy Development. A quick update um, that we, following the, the, the two meetings that the City of Guelph had with the Ministry in November and December last year, we've moved along with the City drafting policies uh, with regards to using prescribed instruments specifically for permits to take water. And these are now in the process of being prepared for circulation to the project team. Uh, the broader project team that also includes Wyoming County, Halton, and regional Waterloo. And uh, in parallel also, we now have a specific uh, date for a meeting with the Ministry of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources, and Forestry on April 27 to discuss approaches for prescribed instrument under the Aggregate Resources Act. Um, so those discussions are moving forward. And once we have a um, package ready through the project team, they will be presented to the 
committee at a future meeting. Just, uh, I mentioned the draft, the transfer payment agreement as well. And you'll see here from the financial update that we've uh, submitted our draft financial updates on the, this current uh, fiscal year 21-22. So that's all under, um, yeah, under in process. And then lastly, just uh, you would have noticed some of the changes to the reports uh, to make them ADA compliant. Uh, we are working on making plan updates and uh, assessment report updates compliant and to support the work that we do as well as across the GRCA, across the organization in other divisions and departments, um, GRCA has hired a, a short-term contract to support, the, support that work. Uh, to make make sure that we have we meet the the, the regulatory requirements and make those reports that are publicly posted uh, accessible. Uh, with regards to plan updates, uh, I can refer to the table and just mention that the first uh, the, that we have had approval of the, the most two recent updates, Grand Valley and Wellington Waterloo, which is great. They were in February, uh, so they are now all any outstanding updates that were with the ministry are now approved. Uh, we're working obviously already on the next one. We call it the Melanchthon brand update that is in relation to Shelburne um, updates. You will hear a little bit later on as well as uh, Guelph. And then we're working on, um, again, you'll hear from a, a report later on today as well with regards to the Bethel Road supply wells and the issue contributing area. So there's technical work there going on that will be captured in a, in a future update. And I'll leave it at that. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Are there any questions for Martin? Andrew? With regard to the uh, specified levy, um, I'm not, do we know how that would might work or are you able to provide uh, any kind of report uh, for at a future meeting to kind of explain how all of that's going to work? Because in, I know in, in the, the case of the Elgin area water system, uh, the intake is under our jurisdiction and the related uh, uh, risk, man but the related risk management uh, activities are, are on the affected municipality. So I'm not sure how all of that is being divided with regard to cost apportionment and who pays for what it sounds like the uh, charges might go to the directly to the municipalities rather than the, rather than the uh, water utility. Martin. Yes, thank you through you, Wendy. Um, thank you, Andrew. That's um, yes, absolutely. I would be happy to provide a a report to the committee at a future date. We actually have a a, a region management committee meeting scheduled for April the twentieth. Uh, where we will be uh, discussing that further. Uh, certainly, a lot of the details still to be uh, figured out, uh, but happy to provide an update in the future. Martin, that would only become a necessity, would it not, if the province ceased to provide 100% funding for the program? Absolutely correct, yes. Good and, for, and yeah, just to clarify that, that is absolutely correct. We have currently funding hopefully in place very soon for the next two years. And then the other thing that would be required to implement it, I think, is that there would have to be um, a negotiated agreement in place before that could happen between the lead conservation authority and whomever. Well, that's, that's part of the... Um, that's part of the, the, the work that still needs to be figured out. I see that um, GRCA has its hand up, probably Sam. Yeah, it's, it's uh, Sam speaking. So the new regulations haven't come out yet. Um, so in the new regulations, they will actually provide the different types of ways in which um, the levies can be determined, but they haven't been released yet. So we're anticipating, hopefully, Sooner rather than later, they will come out. So it will actually provide a bit more clarification on that. But I just want to mention that they haven't come out yet. Thanks, Sam. So basically, Andrew, there would be, um, if the 
province and the lead authority signed the um, budget agreement, it wouldn't be something that would kick in for the next two years. So there is some time to, to work out the details. Okay, any other questions? Seeing none, can I have a mover and a seconder? Alan Dale, I'll move it. Thank you, Alan, seconded by Andrew Henry. All in favor? Yes. Carried, thank you. The next report on the agenda is something I wanted to bring forward to the committee. Um, I had uh, last November an opportunity to have a a one-on-one -on -one discussion with the new uh, Source Protection Program Director. And um, because she was um, new to her position and I wanted to make sure that she uh, got a good um, foundation on the information that was relevant and, and important in uh, the Lake Erie region. So I provided you with the the slides that I um, discussed with her, the character of the region, how we deliver the program, how we're organized. Um, we did it a little differently than um, most other source protection regions across the province. Um, and a lot of it was driven by the complexity and the size and scale um, of uh, the program in the Lake Erie region. Also wanted to highlight some of the accomplishments that we had and some of the um, upcoming work. And really I wanted to um, highlight today the, because um, we were invited to identify any gaps or concerns with the program. And Martin um, helped me put this together and it also is reflective of what some of the other um, committees across the province had been um, interested in. And um, just to give you some kind of sense of what we feel the shortcomings were and also um, how we see it moving forward in a way that we can um, partner with the ministry to help the program evolve. So I'm going to start um, with um, the slide 17, which is where I, I highlighted some of the um, administrative gaps. And Martin, is that something you can do a shared screen for Alona? Can you go to slide 17? Madam Chair, we're just um, going to the slide now and in a moment, we'll share the screen. Okay. Thanks, Alona. Um, the kinds of gaps or concerns that we highlighted were broken down really into three categories, administrative, technical, um, drinking water issues, and um, extending the program beyond municipal services. And these are the kinds of uh, administrative um, concerns, issues, gaps that we felt uh, we felt that there could be um, a more streamlined plan approval uh, process, much like under the Planning Act, where the authority has been delegated over the years from the minister having to sign and approve everything to, um, for very simple administrative things, it's something that senior staff could do, or for maybe medium size issues or reg regular occurring amendments, uh, the director could do it. But we just felt that it would certainly streamline the process. Also, um, 
you have your annual progress reports on the agenda today and some of those um, reports are very detailed and we uh, know that the ministry has been working on um, streamlining this process to make it simpler and the Lake Erie region has about 50 municipalities that have to feed input into these forms and it all kind of gets boiled down. And um, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work. I think it's good work, but if it could be somehow streamlined a little bit, um, we think that would be a useful thing. Also, um, we are concerned that the science-based approach where we've done all the technical studies to support the water quality and water quantity issues for across the watersheds um, are getting to be more out of date. And there's some um, thought that if we used an adaptive management and did some long-term planning, we wouldn't have to repeat them at some time in the future that we could keep them up to date on an ongoing basis. And it would certainly maintain the, the extensive work that's gone into um, them so far and also um, keep them relevant and useful in looking at um, drink, municipal drinking water uh, protection. Can I have the next slide, Alona? Thank you. Just some of the technical issues. Um, you've heard today about road salt. Um, our um, question about aggregate extraction close to municipal wells um, has remained uh, uh, in the forefront. There's new and emerging chemicals that are of concern that aren't covered um, to date and how do they get added. Um, cumulative and non-point sources of contamination could, to be addressed and um, areas with potential water quantity constraints and or conflicts. So there's some things that we felt could perhaps be done there to, um, to smooth the, the program moving forward. The other one uh, is the program extension beyond municipal systems. And that's really what Martin was talking about when he was talking about the best management practices. Um, how do we actually include the non-municipal systems in the source protection plans? And the key ones that are often cited are rural schools, nursing homes in rural areas. For us, that's probably not as big a problem as it is for some other re regions across the province because we have a large proportion of our population serviced by municipal water supply. Others don't have nearly that um, percentage. I think they're, some of them are, are less than 50% of the um, population. And I think this has particularly been an issue for the people in um, Eastern Ontario, because the, we have the, the large uh, drinking water systems, but they really do have a lot more of their population relying on non-municipal systems. Can I have the final slide, please? We wanted to talk about our, our role, and we feel that the Source Protection Committee and the authorities can identify and bring successes and gaps to the ministry's attention. We're really the boots on the ground and we can, can see what's going on and, and have our own successes and or, and or difficulties in implementing the program. We suggested that maybe one of the ways to deal with this is to use pilot projects, um, use local solutions for local problems, and um, finding another way to address the non-municipal drinking water systems using the Clean Water Act tools because they really do allow um, quality and quantity issues to be considered 
off your own property. You've heard um, also that we're relying on the ministry to address technical drinking water issues, road salt and nitrate and below water table, um, aggregate extraction, especially if it's close to municipal wells. And then um, we suggested a solution that the, we use an asset management approach to um, maximize the benefits from the technical work that's already been done. And we had suggested planning for multi-year funding and we are really pleased to see that this year we did get or we, the ministry to propose two-year funding as opposed to just one-year funding. So it'll make a lot easier to plan the program going forward. So those are my um, remarks that I made. And do you have any questions um, about either the information presented or the concerns that were raised? I see Larry has his hand up. Yeah, thanks for that. I see under nitrate, um, you allot that to intensive agriculture. Uh, I have some indication here where I operate a farm and uh, the farm is right near the village of Burford. Yeah. And the highest nitrate sources are right behind the houses where their septic systems are and my field is low. So yeah. when you talk about uh, nitrate and then put right behind it intensive agriculture, I think you need to take another look at that. Okay. Certainly that's not the only source. I agree with you. Best. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say just generally uh, after speaking with Kirsten, after you had your one-on-one -on -one with her, that um, she was very impressed with the presentation and the level of detail provided, and it really helped her gain an understanding of the complexities in the Lake Erie Source Protection Region. So I just wanted to say thank you. It was definitely appreciated. Thanks to you and, and to uh, GRCA staff for putting that together. Thank you very much, Beth. And I should say Kirsten um, uh, was the first director to initiate this one-on-one -on -one, and she plans that it be an annual uh, opportunity for the chair of each uh, source protection authority to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So um, we're looking forward to continuing that process because we also found it very, very helpful um, in, in hearing the feedback. and. Um, just to get a, a much better understanding of what, what's possible and what may take a little longer. Any other questions, um, comments? Can I have a motion to receive the report for information? Bill Strauss. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Larry. Um, all, in, all in favor? Opposed, if any, I don't see any. Thank you very much. The third report that's on the agenda um, is the update to the Shelburne water supply system and Emily, is going to uh, present this to us. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we will, we kept Martin. Oh, okay, thanks, perfect. <laughs> Look at you guys on the ball sharing the screen already for me. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, so um, this report here uh, is just for information right now. Um, we received a draft technical report um, that has updates to the Shelburne well hair protection areas and vulnerability scoring. Um, the updates were done um, as the town requires uh, more water. So before, um, I guess I should, should say, this system is interesting because there's two wells, PW7 and 8, that are within the Grand River watershed. And then the other four wells are actually in our neighboring SPA um, in Nottawasagas uh, conservation area. Um, spa, sorry. So the two, I'm mostly going to focus just on the two in R um, in the GRCA, but um, just know that they did also update all the well health protection areas for all of them. Um, this system here 
is a bedrock system. The four wells in Nottawasega are in the Guelph Formation, so kind of in the upper contact um, zone. And then the two wells, uh, Shelburne 7 and 8, are in the lower like Gasport Aquifer. Um, they pull water from a different aquifer, as uh, they noted before, they had some water quality concerns um, with, with those other wells. Um, so currently right now, well seven is pumping and well eight is just a backup supply for well seven. So in order to pump um, well seven and eight at the same time, they wanted to increase their permit and therefore we needed um, updated wellhead protection areas to ensure there's adequate protection around those drinking water wells. Um, so as of right now, uh, it is in draft and it's under review by both GRCA staff and um, we've also submitted the draft report to the MECP as part of early engagement requirements. Um, and then we obviously work closely with the town um, and provide any of our comments going forward. Um, so just as preliminary draft results, we have um, on, you can see right here on the screen, um, the older wellhead protection areas, which were actually delineated in 2015 um, when well seven came online um, in the darker kind of purple color. And right now it just shows well seven and eight, which are the ones that are in our watershed. Um, the newer wellhead protection areas, larger, as you can see, um, similar orientation. And um, as you know, the pumping rate was obviously increased because of the, the well eight having being pumped at the same time. So you're going to see the larger well protection areas. Um, as part of this study, they also refined the current model that the groundwater model that they were using. So they updated the recharge um, geological layers. So that's why it's you know a little bit bigger too as well. Um, actually, can you show the next slide please and thank you. Awesome. So as well as the wellhead protection areas, they also did uh, transport pathway analysis and they also looked at the vulnerability scoring. Um, right now, this is just the draft vulnerability scoring for those wellhead protection areas. Um, they don't, oh no, they don't have a line on here showing very clearly where the, um, where Grand River crosses over, but but the wellhead protection areas from those four wells in Nottawa, Nottawa Saga do kind of encroach on uh, GRC as well, um, and then vice versa going the other way. So this is actually a very interesting and neat system and requires coordination with um, the town of Melanchthon and neighboring SPAs and ministry and everybody. So um, we've been doing all that to keep things moving with this project. Um, in regards to the transport pathways, there were no adjustments made. They did, they did identify some high risk wells, um, but as for now, they've decided not to include them as transport pathways, um, mainly because sometimes water well records are, aren't the best source of information. They can be uh, not in the right spot, um, but there was a recommendation in the report to go back and um, verify that those, if those wells are there, then they may be considered transport pathways. Um, which was obviously sent to the town. So going forward, kind of next steps for this work here is uh, provide our comments. Um, the ministry will obviously provide theirs whenever they're ready and um, just to finalize everything. Um, and then this work here will be part of, Martin had mentioned before, will be part of a section 34 update mm -hmm. to the Grand River. Um, and it, right now it's titled Melanchthon Brant as it's those are the two main uh, municipalities completing work for that update. Uh, that, that's everything I have to say. So thank you very much. Thank you, Emily. Are there any questions for Emily? John? Yes, um, page 42 report this, uh, going back to the comment made that the consultant recommends that these high risk wells be investigated further. Do we know if the intention is to uh, do any investigation? Emily? Thank you through Madam Chair. Um, I have reached out to the town. Um, I have not received a response back yet on that, on that question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions for Emily? 
Can I have a mover and seconder? I'll move. Thank you, John. Seconder. Bill Strauss. Thank you, Bill. All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you very much. And Emily, I understand you're also going to present the um, next report on the Bethel Road Supply Wells. That's correct. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Um, some of you may recall from the previous uh, Source Protection Committee meeting in December, we brought um, some information from the Bethel Road uh, supply system, which is in the County of Brant, located in Paris. Um, this well field has seen increases in sodium concentrations and, and chloride as well, but most, mostly sodium um, has sharply increased the most. Um, at the last committee meeting, um, there was a recommendation to identify sodium as a issue, capital I issue for this well fields. Um, and part of the next steps was to um, go back and delineate a WAPA, like a well head protection area issue contributing area for that, for that sodium issue. Um, so Lake Erie Region staff have been working with County of Brant staff to, um, to delineate the swap ICA. And I guess I'm just gonna step back for a moment. So the new director technical rules that came out in um, December, uh, 2021, I know before we used to just call them ICAs. Uh, now they've changed the terminology um, to a WAPA ICA and IPZ ICA. So when I say WAPA ICA, I just mean it's an ICA for a wellhead protection area. I'm just using the new terminology now. Okay. Um, <laughs> so moving on from that. Uh, so you can see here in this image, we have delineated um, the ICA around the WAPA D for that well field and additionally encompassed um, the Brant Business Park, which is north of the well field um, in the, within the ICA. Um, also part of the new director technical rules, it allows uh, the delineation of a ICA outside of the WAPA-D or a vulnerable area, I should say, um, provided that there is enough evidence um, to prove that you know, there's, they're hydraulically connected. Um, so in this case, what this report kind of shows, um, details the evidence to show that the Brant Business Park is contributing sodium to the, the Bethel well field. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so the report looks at a few different um, a few different avenues of evidence, and all this evidence was gathered from various reports that um, consultants had completed for the county of Brant, like on behalf of the county, as well as some additional monitoring that the county had done themselves um, for like monitoring wells and and monitoring at their own production wells, obviously too. So. Just to, to re kind of talk about the Bethel well field, I know I talked about it last meeting, but just to refresh everybody, um, over, they're overburden wells, they're kind of intermediate overburden. There's no protector of confining aquifer, um, which makes them susceptible to surface contamination. Um, in the past, this well field has been susceptible to nitrate um, contamination. It used to have a nitrate ICA. Um, there was before the Brant Business Park was built and before it was more developed in the area, it was all agricultural fields um, surrounding the, the well field. So the nitrate, we had seen it go down um, and now we have this, this sodium issue. Um, in the map, we kind of, in the report, we looked at not only the Brant Business Park, but we briefly also kind of looked, there's an MTO works yard. I'm sure you're all aware. There's some salt domes there. Um, those salt domes, we looked at the drainage the drainage plan um, and the salt domes drain, like the area where the salt domes are drain away from the well field, whereas the Brant Business Park, um, that is the actual drainage area that goes to a swim pond. So you can see the swim pond is labeled. And basically what the swim pond does is it captures all of the runoff from that Brant Business Park. And then from the swim pond, there's an infiltration gallery 
and it flows into the infiltration gallery. And that's just perforated pipes um, in like the over shallow overburden. So ultimately what, what happens, um, well, was suspected that is happening is that those wells are pumping and the sodium from the runoff from likely road salt, um, like de-icing road salt from the Brant Business Park is entering the wells. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me, getting over a little bit of a cold here. So this report, um, this is a, a proposed draft ICA, um, obviously welcome to feedback and it will be submitted to the ministry um, as part of early engagement for their feedback as well. And we're still working with the County of Brant very closely having meetings talking about, um, you know, what type of policies um, is kind of our next step going forward, what, what type of policies they would like for this ICA. Um, and yeah, and then once once we kind of gather all that information and 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 everybody is is satisfied with the size of the ICA and the policies, we'll, we're going to bring it back to the committee, the Social Protection Committee, um, um, at the hopefully next meeting, and uh, propose those policies so you guys can all take a look at them, and then obviously bring it back to incorporate into an update to the Grand River um, Social Protection Plan and Assessment Report. <laughs> So with that, um, that's everything I, I have to say. I know there's a lot more information in the report, but um, if you have any specific questions, please feel free to uh, ask and hopefully I can answer them for you. Thanks, thanks. Emily. Paul? Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. To Emily, Emily, what, what are some of the solutions to this problem? That's number one question. Number two, you've ruled out the MTA, MTO salt domes for sure, but Anyway, more importantly, what are the solutions to this problem? Well, <laughs> through you, Madam Chair, this is certainly a, a tricky um, situation here. Um, I mean, hopefully uh, we can have some work with the county on policies that may be helpful to mitigate some of the road salt that is applied I don't have all the answers. Um, I'm obviously open to anyone's uh, input and happy to bring back to the county. Um, and I'm sure the county has maybe some ideas too, hopefully uh, going forward with ways to mitigate this, but. Thank you, Emily. Eric? Yes, um, thanks Emily for that. Um, I guess my question uh, is really why we don't have a chloride issue at this supply well as well. Um, you know, typically we see, uh, and the chemical nature of sodium chloride is the chloride travels at the speed unrestricted of the groundwater and moves uh, without, uh, without retar retardation. Whereas the sodium tends to be, uh, because of its chemical properties, uh, binds uh, to the soil uh, a little bit more so and, and isn't doesn't move as quickly. So the fact that we have sodium but no chloride to me is inconsistent with the way we see sodium chloride normally behaving in the environment. And I'm just wondering whether the consultant that was hired had any um, further um, insights onto that issue. Thank you, Eric, through you, Madam Chair. Um, so the one consultant um, that did, there's, there was a few studies that were done. So the one consultant performed a study that looked at various properties um, within the Brant Business Park and the kind of like the culverts that um, where the stormwater was, was exiting to go into, and then obviously the stormwater pond itself. And they took samples from um, all of those culverts, including the swim pond for both sodium and chloride. Mm -hmm. um, they did also see, obviously, like in the spring months, um, high inputs of sodium and chloride, and then kind of more in the summer months, they, they didn't see those same high numbers, um, which makes sense with the road salt application. So chloride concentrations are increasing, just not at the same um, rate as the sodium. And yes, I do agree with you absolutely that um, you know, sodium chloride tend to go together. It was just decided um, with the county at this time to start with the sodium issue and then 
um, you know, keep watching, keep monitoring for chloride as well. That's kind of where they're at right now. Yeah, and perhaps um, through you, Madam Chair, um, that it, it may also be somewhat of a flushing uh, issue as well, that if the sodium and chloride from a single season uh, is able to move through that system relatively quickly because it is somewhat shallow and goody, uh, that the, what you're seeing is, is the residual sodium at the end of a season uh, that, that, uh, that remains because it hasn't flushed through as quickly because of the different chemical properties of that chemical. So thank you, Emily. Thank you, Eric. Larry. Thanks, and through you to, to anyone doing the research, I just wonder, Emily, was there any samples taken from the gravel pit side? Uh, once you open soil, take surface soil off. I mean, it's just a direct pathway for anything that comes into a gravel pit to get right into the water source and uh, silica. I, I don't know the relationship, but I'm just curious as to whether there could be a source on that side. Thank you, Larry, through Madam Chair. Yes, very aware of um, that aggregate extraction that's happening across the road there. Um, I don't know of any direct sodium chloride type inputs that would be into that. Um, right now, that is identified as a transport pathway. Um, so the vulnerability is increased in that area. Not all of it is currently um, excavated. I know kind of the more Southern part has been, um, but not all of it yet. It's certainly something to look into. They have, actually I should double check. I'm not hundred percent sure how many monitoring wells they have over there, um, but they do also take samples from their monitoring walls um, as well. And just on top of that, um, you know, things can always be reevaluated and if it is a source of sodium, then I mean, it could obviously be added to the ICA if, if there was proof that it was. So um, yeah, but thank you very much for that comment. And it's certainly something to think about and, and something to keep watch on. And I'm sure the County of Brant if, is aware of it as well. Um, yeah. Eric? Yes, uh, through you, Madam Chair, again, just following up on Larry's comment, uh, there were recent changes to the Aggregate Resources Act, which now require uh, all uh, aggregate operators to have plans in place for dust control. And the only two approved dust control methods beyond water are those that contain sodium and chloride. Um, so, you know, I think that in terms of implementation of source protection planning, uh, or sorry, of implementation of source protection policies that, that one that might be beneficial would be to try to put a condition on the site plan to um, prohibit uh, use of sodium and chloride based de-icers, sorry, um, dust suppressants uh, on the adjacent aggregate pit. Thank you, Eric. Any further comments, questions? I just kind of follow up, Wendy, and, and, and thanks for that, Eric. They're good suggestions. Um, I just wanted to ask you, Emily, I had a second part to my question. Have, you have ruled out the salt domes from MTO. They're just so close. It just kind of, kind of makes me wonder. Yes, thank you through you, Madam Chair. Um, the consultant report that was written um, basically had said, you know, they, they sampled in the area. Um, the water is being routed, like uh, the, the drainage of the area is being routed off site um, away from the wells. Now, that being said, I mean, it, there's always a possibility, um, but also the, I know those salt domes are covered. I know, yes, okay, they wash their equipment sometimes too, and some salt can wash off. It's obviously not a perfect design, um, but I think it just has to work within the constraints of what it is. Um, yeah, that's all. That's all I really know about that is from the consultant report of, of what they what they had measured, um, of what they know from the drainage in the area. Uh, Paul, it's Martin here to jump in. If I may, uh, Emily, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that uh, we also looked at the timing. 
the increase in sodium and to a lesser extent uh, in chloride at the, those drinking water wells were, were really linked to the establishment of the business park. The MTO salt domes are in existence for much, much longer. And we haven't seen any increase during that, uh, during that time. So it was only once the business park was established that we saw the increases in, the, in contamination. Um, so that timing kind of suggests that the salt domes were not really a contributor to, the, to that uh, sodium increase. Thanks, Martin. I, I did forget to mention that. <laughs> my brain fog must have uh, erased that from my memory momentarily, but yes, absolutely, you are correct. Any other questions or comments? Can I have a mover to accept the report for information? Andrew Henry, a seconder. Eric Hodgins, thank you. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Thank you very much. The next report um, is a proposed approach for um, impervious surface calculations. And Stuart, I believe, is presenting this report. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just going to uh, share the screen here. Just bear with me a second. I'll put back on that same presentation pack we had before uh, continue on. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to be uh, just presenting uh, for information purposes, a proposed approach that we put together uh, for creating a uh, impervious surface uh, base layer um, that uh, will be used for some of the percent impervious surface recalculation work that'll be likely coming up in the next little while. Um, so I'd like to start off with um, just a recap of what percent impervious surface area data is. So essentially it's a measure of the percentage of impervious surfaces in a given area where uh, de-icing salt can be applied. So we're talking about surfaces like roads and sidewalks and parking lots and uh, things like that. Um, origi originally, the um, technical rules mandated that these calculations be done on sort of a one by one kilometer uh, grid. And uh, we've got a uh, sort of an illustration here on the screen of some of the existing data that we have uh, in the watershed. So essentially a calculation was done for each grid cell and then it was draped over top of whatever uh, protection zone the, the uh, uh, calculations were to be applied to. Um, this is an important layer because it's, it's necessary for RMOs to determine where the application of road salt can be a, uh, a drinking water threat as per the tables of drinking water threats. And uh, therefore, we have data currently for all areas of the watershed where the vulnerability score is high enough uh, for that threat to, to potentially exist. Um, okay, so a number of um, developments have occurred over the last little while that uh, make the recalculation of some of this data um, ideal in some areas of the watershed. Uh, firstly, the tables of drinking water threats have changed, as you all know. Um, previously, uh, for the application of road salt to be a significant threat, you had to be in an area where the percentage of impervious surface was at least 80% or higher. That's now been reduced down to 60%. Uh, that's for groundwater. And for surface water, it's gone from 8% to, to uh, 3%, I believe. Uh, now, in most cases, that's fine. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that we do have some data that's categorical only, and uh, the existing categories in our data don't align with the new categories and the drinking water tables. Uh, so therefore, those, uh, that data will have to be recalculated uh, in some cases. Uh, secondly, uh, the technical rules also now require calculations for issue contributing areas where sodium and or chloride has been identified as an issue. So that's a second thing that will potentially require some recalculations. Uh, number three, 
um, the one by one kilometer grid that the technical rules originally mandated, as I kind of showed you on the previous slide, uh, th those are no longer required. Um, now, it's not essential that we use an alternative approach necessarily, but it does open up the possibility that we can use an alternative like a smaller grid or a completely different approach uh, much more easily if it, it seems to make more sense in certain areas of the, uh, the watershed. And uh, fourthly, the existing data that we have is old. Uh, some of it actually dates from before 2010 in some areas. Um, so there's an opportunity to to update the percentage impervious surface data in areas where there has been land use changes and growth and whatnot. Um, so there's a number of different reasons why uh, this particular data set will need to be updated the next little while. Um, it's intended that in many cases, this work will probably be done by the municipalities themselves, um, but uh, Lake Erie staff will certainly be um, available to assist and provide advice uh, where we're required. So one of the ways that Lake Erie staff um, are going to be providing assistance is regarding the procurement of source data. Um, one of the difficult things about calculating percentage impervious surface area is that in many areas, not all necessarily, but many areas of the watershed, it's hard to find uh, precise data on things like sidewalks and driveways and parking lots. Um, so what we've put together is, is an approach where we're looking to uh, create a base layer that will estimate uh, the proportion of these kinds of surfaces throughout the watershed and uh, providing that as sort of a source layer that can be used uh, for the calculation of percentage of previous surfaces uh, where, where more accurate data isn't available. And uh, we're going to be doing this essentially by incorporating roads and non-road surfaces independently. So essentially, this is sort of an example of what the final base layer will look like. We're still working on it now. So unfortunately, I don't have the actual layer to show you. But um, now the, the base layer will, of course, cover the entire watershed. Uh, this is just a zoomed in area just for illustration purposes. So essentially, we're going to be looking at four different land use categories. We're going to be starting with roads. Uh, obviously, that's the key impervious surface where road salt is applied. Uh, we're getting that data from the interior road network layer. and uh, for the, um, for the purposes of this, obviously, we're assuming that that is 100% impervious uh, for the sake of application of road salt. Now, the three other land use categories you see here, residential, commercial, industrial, and other, uh, we're going to be getting those from our 4DM land cover data. Um, these particular uses are essentially are covering the things like the parking lots and the driveways and stuff like that, stuff that we don't have precise information on. But what we're going to be doing for them is we're going to be using a random point sampling approach. So essentially what we're going to be doing for those is we're going to be generating a series of random points throughout the watershed. We're going to be doing this for all four CAs. This particular map just gives an example for the GRCA. Um, and then for each of these points, we're going to quickly go through in a, a manual process of um, using our ortho imagery to determine if each point falls within a uh, impervious surface where uh, de-icing salt could be applied like a parking lot or a pathway, or if it falls on an area where de-icing salt is not likely to be applied like a grassy area or rooftop, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we're basically generating a sort of a random sampling approach. And then once we've got that done, we can then use those uh, sampling points to then estimate the overall proportion of impervious surfaces for each of those three land use categories I showed you on the previous map. So in the previous map, we've just sort of provided some uh, example percentages. Again, roads, we're assuming are 100% de-icing area. Uh, this example, of course, is not the finished product, but we're just throwing in some numbers. For example, 12.5% uh, for residential, 22, or 25.8 for commercial, et cetera. So essentially what we're doing is providing sort of an estimation. We're providing a layer that provides roads and an estimation of the non-road surfaces where de-icing salt can be applied. Um, it's not meant to be the final layer. It's meant to be um, a source input that municipalities can use and internal staff, uh, any agency that, that's looking for data that doesn't have more accurate data and needs it to, to do present impervious service area calculations. Uh, one of the other things we're also working on too um, is that, like I said uh, in, my, in my previous slide, the one by one kilometer grid approach is no longer mandated. Um, so one of the other things we're looking at is we're, we're experimenting with different, um, different size grids and uh, different uh, alternative techniques to, to making final calculations. 
just to see what might work best, what might uh, provide more realistic results or more suitable results uh, than the one by one kilometer grid. And again, this is just something we're testing. Uh, we'll be doing this, of course, for some of the data that we're calculating, as well as providing any any input uh, or sorry, any uh, any advice that we, we can glean from this uh, to the municipalities and to other agencies that are working on this kind of data. Um, so that's basically the end of that report. It's more for information. Um, if anybody has any questions, please let me know. And uh, it's back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any questions for Stuart? Any comments? Eric? Lots of questions for me today. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Uh, Stuart, uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm a little confused by this, uh, by the random point generator. Uh, and I guess part of my confusion is, you know, in an urban area, like in a built up urban area, you could use that random point to give you a reasonable uh, randomness to uh, a sort of a closed set of land uses. But when you then step outside that to agricultural areas, doesn't that involve a doesn't that create a bias in and of itself because uh well one you don't have rural areas identified uh per se as a land use category where there, where there might be imperviousness and maybe that's because it's such a small amount but like i just i just don't understand how that randomness that random calculator gives you uh sort of a statistically valid way of us of establishing what the percent imperviousness is in under certain uh, land categories. Yes, thank you, Eric, and through you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, that is a good valid point. Um, we're, there's a couple of things that I, I should point out. Um, the land use categories that we're using, they, they were taken from the best data that we have available for the entire watershed. Um, they're not necessarily um, a huge um, array of different categories, but those are the best that, that we have to work with for the entire watershed. The rural areas, interestingly, are mostly defined. Now, I don't really have the slide up, but there were three categories that we had. We had residential, uh, industrial, commercial, and uh, the other category, which is essentially everything that was mostly not built up. So the rural areas are mostly in that other category. And uh, the way that we're proposing to undertake the point sampling approach is that we're essentially generating uh, a point sampling for each of those categories. So the number that we're generating is based on uh, what is statistically significant at a 95% confidence interval. Um, and so for, for the other um, category that is mostly rural, that will be uh, given its own a series of points uh, the residential one, which is obviously mostly urban, that will be given its own set of points. And the industrial commercial, which is out also mostly urban, is also uh, given its own set of points. So we've tried to make some allocation to try to improve that. Uh, we know it's not perfect, um, but it's, it's, it's the best that we have with the time that we have to work on it, with the software we have to use, and the data that we have to put into it. Uh, but we're certainly open to any other suggestions that might come in of, of other sources of data or even other ways of doing it. It's, it's like I say, it's the best, uh, it's the best approach that we were able to devise with the resources at hand. Okay, th thank you, uh, Stuart. I, I guess I, the clarification you provided for me is that the, you will get a random number of points generated for each of the four categories. So that, that, that yes. in itself removes the bias. So that was, that was the clarification that helped me. Thanks very much. That's good. Any other questions for Stuart? Seeing none, can I have a mover to receive this report for information? Alan Dale, a seconder, George Schneider, all in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously, thank you very much. Moving on now to our annual progress reports. Ilona, are you presenting these? Yes, I am. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'll first start with the Kettle Creek annual progress report. So annual reporting uh, for all source protection areas, as a reminder, is due for submission to the ministry by May 1st annually. 
And for those of you uh, who aren't familiar, annual reporting for source protection, it actually consists of two reports. The first is the annual progress reporting supplemental form. And the second is the public facing annual report. The supplemental form has two questions that require the source protection committee's input. The first is the committee's opinion on the extent to which the objectives of the plan have been achieved. And the second is comments to explain how the committee arrived at its opinion. So for the Kettle Creek source protection area, Lake Erie region staff recommend that the objectives of the plan are progressing well and are on target. And the rationale is that there are only two existing significant drinking water threats when the plan was uh, first approved and came into effect in the Kettle Creek source protection area. And since that time, both threats have been addressed. Also 86% of the legally binding plan policies that address these significant threats are either implemented, they're in progress or implemented because policy outcomes have been evaluated and require no further action. About 13% of the policies do not require response or they're not applicable. So for these two reports, um, in addition to uh, a letter from the Kettle Creek Source Protection Authority Chair, those three items will be submitted to the ministry by Lake Erie Region staff on behalf of the Kettle Creek Source Protection Authority. And just to note, um, for the Kettle Creek annual reports and the Long Point Region, Catfish Creek and Grand River reports that you have in front of you, um, Lake Erie Region staff will also make sure that we review those reports again. And if there's any additional clarity that we feel needs to be added or improve the reports, we will be doing that prior to submission. And that's the report for Kettle Creek. Any questions for Ilona on the Kettle Creek report? Seeing none. Can I have a mover, please? I'll move. Linda Dixon and Bill Strauss seconded. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried unanimously, thank you. So on to the Catfish Creek annual report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the Catfish Creek Source Protection Area, Lake Erie Region staff also recommend that the objectives of the plan are progressing well and they're on target. And the rationale for this is that 19 significant drinking water threats were identified in the Catfish Creek Source Protection Area when, when the plan was first approved. And then since implementation of that plan, 100% of those significant threats have been addressed. Also, all the legally binding plan policies that address those significant threats, they're either implemented or they are in progress. So similar to, Cat, uh, sorry, similar to Kettle Creek, um, these two annual reports, along with the submission letter from the Catfish Creek Source Protection Authority Chair, they will be submitted to the ministry by like your region staff on behalf of the Catfish Creek Source Protection Authority. That is it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Can I have a mover, please? I'll move that one, Madam Chair. Chairman. Thank you. Seconder? Alan, I'll second it. Thank you, Alan. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried unanimously, thank you. The third annual progress report is the Long Point Region one. And Ilona? Yes. Go ahead, please. Thank you. So uh, for the Long Point Region source protection area, Lake Erie Region staff recommend that the implementation of the source protection plan is progressing well, but remains short of target in achieving the plan's objectives. 
Um, this change of progressing well slash short of target is actually a, an amendment to the three options that are provided by the ministry in annual reporting, which are progressing well, satisfactory, sorry, progressing well and on target. The second is satisfactory and the third is limited progress made. So we've, we, we've gone ahead and actually tweaked that first category um, because we felt it better represented what was actually going on in Long Point uh, Source Protection Area. So our rationale is there's 701 uh, significant drinking water threats that are identified in the Long Point Region Source Protection Area since the latest plan approval. Um, the percentage of overall progress made addressing those threats is 51%. So this is a decrease compared to the 2020 annual reporting uh, percentage, which was previously 68%. And one of the differences um, between the 2020 and 2021 results is in part due to an error um, from the 2020 results uh, from Norfolk County. They had just uh, misunderstood one of the questions where they count the number of enumerated threats. So the numbers that were entered for one of our questions was incorrectly entered, um, but they corrected that for 2020. So we do have correct results from 2020 for Norfolk County. Uh, additionally, 99% of legally binding policies that address significant threats are implemented or they're in progress or they're implemented because policy outcomes were evaluated and no further action was needed. Now, the reason for our tweaking of this category to progressing well short of target um, is that really these significant drinking water threats, the progress has been impacted by sort of several factors outside of the control of those implementing bodies. And that includes a source protection update in 2020, so that actually increased the number of significant drinking water threats on the landscape by about 10%. And there was also a significant increase in the number of development reviews in 2020 and 2021, which uh, subsequently, it really did increase the workload for municipalities and risk management officials and risk management um, inspectors. And then, of course, most significantly was the COVID-19 pandemic. So a lot of our implementing bodies reported to us that those COVID-19 public health measures really did impede their ability to address those significant threats, um, namely septic system inspections and the development of risk management plans. So that's why we, we sort of opted with those factors in mind to change uh, that target to progressing well short of target because it almost was like that target uh, kept moving and we wanted that to be reflected in um, the progress for Long Point Region Source Protection Area. So again, this, uh, well, these Long Point Region Source Protection, uh, source protection reports along with the submission letter from the Long Point Region Source Protection Authority Chair. Um, we, like a region staff, we will submit them to the ministry on behalf of the Long Point Region Source Protection Authority. And that is the end of the report. Thank you very much, Ilona. I think um, in, in reading the report, um, your suggested way of handling the, the overall descriptor, I think is very good because the other, um, the next category down of um, satisfactory kind of suggests that some of the commitment for the program had been lost. And I, I think the municipalities have been working really hard um, and on the program and it's just, they've been overtaken by a, a series of events. John has a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I like to suggest that the calculation on page, I believe, uh, 167, um, the comments there be uh, be the same as the comments in the uh, Grand River Annual uh, Progress Report. Uh, in other words, to take into account the threats that were addressed, but there was nothing found. So I'll just read a comment out and um, and, and just. Uh, <clears throat> 
In addition to the 51% progress made in addressing SDWTs, it is important to recognize the amount of work and effort that was required to remove 130 SWTs from column C. Number of threats were added initially at the same time of source protection plan approval, but have been removed slash subtracted as a result of field verification showing they were not engaged in or that they no longer being engaged in. Some risk management officials feel that the ministry calculation underestimates the work required to move a threat to a C status and would prefer the calculation be C plus D all over A plus B. So I, I think there's a lot of work, as uh, you I mentioned, Madam Chair, that uh, it's done and uh, addressing uh, threats that were turning that have turned out not to be threats, I think is part of the package that should be recognized by the, by the ministry. I think that's a really good comment. And I think that um, it, it's particularly helpful to do that, especially where you're adding additional threats with amendments to the plans. Uh, both catfish and kettle had, have had no amendments, section 34 amendments. So they've remained stable, whereas Long Point and um, the Grand River plans have had uh, a lot of additions with section 34 additions. And I think that it, it, it is a lot of work to um, get rid of the threats or, or investigate threats to know that they're really no longer threats. So I think that's a good suggestion to also add to the, um, the um, long point plan. And Madam Chair, sorry. Yes, yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, Madam Chair, um, we agree that definitely something we can do. Um, that, that comment's applicable in Grand River and it's certainly applicable in Long Point region as well. We've heard that from municipalities through our implementation working group about the amount of work, as, as um, Wendy was saying, that it takes. And this, he's referring, John uh, was referring to sort of column C. That's the number of significant drinking water threats that are removed in a sense from the count because, for example, a risk management official might go out into the field, go to a property, do an inspection, and find out it's actually not a significant drinking water threat. And the time and effort to go out and do all this is, is quite a bit. And if you look um, at your supplemental forms and the number of threats in column C for Long Point region, it, it's quite high. And so to not have that reflected um, is, is a bit difficult and it's not really reflected in the calculation. So we, we definitely agree that we can take that comment as John suggested, that's currently in the grand and sort of amend it slightly and tweak it and then put it into the Long Point region supplemental form. I, I'm curious, Ilona, um, if you did calculate um, the um, percentage of work completed using that alternate formula, what percentage would you come up with? Yes, I might take me a moment to find it. I did the recalculations. I don't have them off. Madam Chair, I did a quick calculation. Oh, how perfect. Percent. It's 60%? Yeah. Perfect. That's great. Thank you. I think that might be a, a good thing to stick in there. Yes. Um, just in the comment great. section. Um, Absolutely. So that um, you get a sense of it does make a difference. Yes. That's absolutely something we can do. Okay. And um, the other thing I was, um, I'd like some of the extra information that came out in your presentation. And I was wondering um, if we could, um, as part of the explanation of progressing well short of target, identify which um, factors, which were septic systems, septic inspections and preparation of risk management plans um, were the reasons why um, you got short of target. Because it's not short of target overall, but it, it's, right. it's um, and 
in your forward facing document on page 141, for example, it says a message from your lo local source protection committee. And if somebody doesn't dive deeper into the whole report, that right. sort of the owner doesn't really clarify what's caused that change. Yes, I would agree that you're right. Unless someone were to read all of the information, and all the, although the reports are relatively short, the public facing ones, I think they're only six or seven pages. But unless you go through each of those categories, as you mentioned, you may not see um, the septic systems or read through the risk management plan. Maybe you just go to the report and you want to see how things are going overall and, you know, look at page two. So I agree if, if we add a piece at the end um, where we mentioned that it's short of target to, to, um, to reflect the influence of these factors and we can add in a piece specifically about the risk management plans um, and inspections, I think that would sort of fill out that response a little better. Thank you. Any other comments from the committee? Um, I think we could probably um, pass the um, recommendation as it is, or but um, with and direct staff to make those clarifications that John's identified and maybe add some additional wording as I have suggested without actually putting it into the, um, the recommendation. With that clarification, could I have a mover for the report? John Sapoulis, Ian McDonald, second. All in favor? Opposed, if any? Thank you, carried unanimously. Um, and then the final um, annual progress report, Ilona? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So the final report is for the Grand River Source Protection uh, Area. So for the Grand River, uh, Lake Erie Region staff, again, recommend that implementation of the Source Protection Plan is progressing well, but like Long Point Region, remains short of target in achieving the plan's objectives. And for the Grand River, the rationale is that we've got about 11,266 significant drinking water threats that have been identified in this area since the last source protection plan approval. So the overall percentage of progress made in addressing these threats is about 26%. So this is comparable to 2020, which was about 27%. It is an improvement over 2019 that was 21%. We also have 98% of the legally binding plan policies that address those threats, they're either implemented in, pro um, in progress or implemented um, because again, the policy outcomes were evaluated. It was determined that nothing else needed to be done. So the factors impacting this progress, this 26%, they are, we basically use the same language. They're the same as for Long Point region. And Again, really impacted by a few, well, several factors and predominantly, again, source protection plan updates. So we had updates and approvals in 2020 and in 2021, and that really did increase the number of drinking water threats and by about 15% overall. So that's quite a large increase. Um, and again, like in Long Point Region, we had a lot of development reviews for the municipalities to work through in 2020 and 2021. So that took up a lot of their time. And then again, the COVID-19 pandemic, the health restrictions really impeded um, implementing bodies and their ability to address those threats. And similarly, there was the same issue with septic system inspections and risk management plans. So for those same reasons, um, we also decided to sort of change the category to progressing well on target to uh, reflect the influence of those factors. And we'll make sure um, with some of the suggestions that we have here that were mentioned for Long Point Region and some of the tweaks 
and um, from John and from Wendy, we'll make sure that we add those uh, slight revisions when we submit the report for the Grand River watershed. So the submission for the Grand River, again, like the other three watersheds, it'll consist of those two reports, the submission letter from the Grand River Source Protection Authority Chair, and then we Lake Erie Region staff will submit it on behalf of the Grand River Source Protection Authority. And that's the report. Any questions for Ilona? Paul? Thank you, Madam Chair. Ilona, I just wanted to ask you something quick. Of You said 11,266 significant drinking water threats and we've addressed 26%, and but that's short of target. I've been glancing through this and I, I couldn't see what the target was. What is the, <laughs> we're short of a target, but what's the target? <laughs> And there's the question that mm -hmm. we, to some degree, you know, uh, a staff here have been struggling with trying to understand what the target is. And, you know, we've had a lot of discussions with our implementation working group that I'm sure uh, Linda could speak to as well. Um, trying, I mean, this is, it's tricky because it's sort of ministry language where it say progressing well on target. That was the original um, category. Now we're saying progressing well short of target because the targets, I guess, are sort of these internal targets that these, for example, municipalities or implementing bodies have set for themselves. You know, for example, septic systems, they know they have to inspect, last, let's just say last year in 2021, say maybe they had to inspect 100 septic systems. That's their target. And they have a bunch of targets, um, source water related. But because of COVID and other factors, they were unable in a lot of cases, they couldn't reach their target. So although they're progressing, it's sort of like they're progressing well relative to everything that they have to deal with, but their targets have shifted. So that's why we were trying to find language that we felt best reflected what was actually happening on the ground. And I don't know if that, if that sort of explained it, or if Linda, you have anything else to add, or Martin, but those were the discussions we had with our municipalities. I, Linda, did I, you want to have a comment? Chair, yeah, sure, Madam Chair. So I, I think I know what you're you're maybe getting at there, Paul, and you're saying like, what is a target? Like, what what are they act? And yeah. I think it's kind of a subjective thing, actually. Yeah. Because there's not really anything in the in the reporting that says, oh, you're supposed to meet 50% or 75% or whatever, right? It's just kind of an internal thing as Alona yeah. spoke to it. But um, I, I there there was some really good discussion, and that's the the wording that came out of, of the group. I think that's a really good suggestion. And I do appreciate the comments that have been made by the committee today, and I think the uh, the working group would appreciate those as well because they're working hard right. at it. It's just there's a lot of factors, but I think it's Madam, subjective. Yeah, thanks, Linda. Very, Madam Chair, can I just ask? So, would it be worthwhile to try and set a target? I, it gives us some name for, and uh, it keeps our we can measure what we're doing and our performance a little better than if there's no target at all. Um, Martin, Paul, just to help answer your question, I'm going to ask Martin a question. For the septic systems, my recollection, my bad memory tells me that they had five years to inspect all the septic beds that were in place. And many municipalities divided that into five, and that's how they got their annual target. Um, it's probably not something that the committee can set the target on because it's the municipalities individually that set the target. But um, it's, it's, and then I thought also when the plans were first adopted, there was a, a thinking that um, within a five year time frame, the plans would largely be able to be implemented. But what's also been happening is, especially in the grand plan, I believe there's been 12 or 13 um, Section 34 amendments that have added more threats over the last two. And well, maybe I'm counting the two that got approved early this year. So 
somehow we need to be able to look at how the changes are affecting these percentages and the, and the conclusions. And I also think we're not the only source protection region that's struggling with this terminology. So Martin, can, can you add anything to that? Uh, absolutely, yes. Thank you, Wendy, and, and through you. So when we talk about the, you know, progressing well on target, the ministry refers back to the objective of the Clean Water Act, the objectives of the plan, and that would ultimately be the implementation, the full implementation of the policies and having everything in place, meaning all risk management plans in place, all septic systems inspected as per the building code uh, requirements. But those are broader targets in terms of plan implementation. They need to translate down into, as we just suggested and discussed, into annual uh, targets that municipalities may have to establish. Because if we have, as you see for the grant, 11,266 uh, threats that need to be implemented, that is not going to be something that we that municipalities can do in one year. Uh, so, and it is very um, different from municipality to municipality. Speaking, you know, in terms of larger uh, municipalities with larger numbers, and then smaller municipalities with with fewer uh, threats to look at. So, the overall target is that would be clear in terms of the objectives of the plan, but those individual targets, they're, they're separate and uh, distinct from one municipality to one to the other municipality because the, we can't impose the same kind of standard or the same target across the board. And I think that's where the, the messaging is becomes difficult if we then roll it up into a, an overarching watershed uh, kind of message that should reflect what's happening on the ground individually at, in different parts of the area over the watershed. Uh, so the, it's certainly something, and I think uh, Lorna mentioned before, or we, we mentioned in, in earlier reports, we are working with other source protection regions across the province uh, in, a, in a kind of local working group with our neighbors and others to and also make recommendations to the province with respect to how we can overall streamline and kind of improve the messaging, improve the questions that we need to report on uh, for annual reporting. I think it is still something that is takes a lot of work, both at the municipal level, as well as at our level, to then report back something to the province. Um, and then it's getting rolled up at the provincial level to, to really figure something out that is maybe more meaningful um, and quite frankly, less work. Uh, so we have a bit of work to do. Um, and, and obviously also you know, working with the province to figure out where they wanna go uh, with this because they have their reporting to do as well. Yeah. Sorry, Madam Oops. Chair, I may add to that. So yeah, the annual reporting working group, we, we've started, this is, as Martin said, it's it's some source protection regions and municipalities. Um, as you said, we're trying to improve the annual reporting questions, including this question, you know, the objectives of the plan, how are things going? And you, you sort of get three options. And this language, even when we've sort of preliminarily discussed it as a group, is progressing well on target. We struggled with it as a group to figure out what that meant, especially the on target piece. So for this year, it was sort of, you know, for 2021, it was like, okay, well, how can we amend this a little to sort of make it work for now that this sort of works for this year, but moving forward this spring and summer, our group really wants to sort of tackle some of these key questions again. And, and this may be one of the questions where we propose some suggestions or revisions to the ministry that more accu accurately sort of reflect how the program is progressing in a sense and moving along um, because it's challenging. You think of you know, the risk management plans, it's highlighted in the public facing annual report and you have to say, well, how's risk management plan going? Well, it's real, that, that's really hard to determine. How do you determine if it's progressing well or on target? when you have all these different municipalities with all these different goals, if you're a small municipality and had two threats that needed RMPs, risk management plans, and they're in place, it's going really, really well. If you're, for example, I'll just say, you know, the region Waterloo, that is hundreds and hundreds of threats and it's gonna take them a long time to get through them and get all those RMPs, 
they may be doing really well and chugging through it, but they still don't have that many in place because it's just staffing resources and time. So the optics, that looks like they're not doing as well. So that's why that was sort of a long explanation for saying we, we agree that these categories are confusing and, and hopefully next year we can improve upon them. Thanks, Alona. Beth, you had your hand up. Yes, thanks so much. I just wanted to add to uh, to what Martin and Alona have been saying in that, you know, from a province's perspective, we've been, we have given very, very high level and broad uh, targets. Like I know I would, I just pulled up um, the provincial roll up from 2020 for annual progress reporting um, and for addressing existing significant drinking water threats. It says, you know, obviously the target would be hundred percent generally. Um, and on average, 83% of existing significant drinking water threats were addressed across the province in that year. But what does that metric actually mean? Um, right. For a lot of the Northern um, source protection authorities, where they're not having multiple section 34s happening year over year, their, their numbers are more static. So they, they possibly could reach that 100% target. But for many others like yourselves, that's not, it's it's gonna be a moving target every single year. So coming up with a, with a way to report on that, that makes sense is, is difficult. And then to add to that too, is, is like Martin was saying that every municipality is different and every source protection authority is different. So how do you create something that works for everyone? Um, and risk management plans as well. Like I know for for, for Lake Erie, um, you have no time frame associated with um, your risk management plan policies, whereas other regions chose to put an implementation time frame on their risk management plan policies. So they can use that metric, perhaps, like they said, they wanted to get all risk management plans established within five years. So they can use that as a metric. Um, but I know that other areas have been struggling to, to meet that because of everything that's been going on. So all, all that to say is that we understand that there are certainly a lot of a lot of challenges. It's the 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 beauty of this program and the struggle of this program that it's all different and locally driven. Um, but uh, we appreciate all the feedback, and we'll certainly try our best to make changes that make sense and make reporting make sense. And um, probably Beth at the next chairs forum. We'll um, see the provincial reporting and the uh, across the whole province uh, with the uh, information that each source protection uh, region has provided, and and that's that's quite interesting. Beth Beth is right because um, the challenges and and the uh, capabilities and the um, source protection problems are quite different across the province. And yet we're making it all work. So, um, Paul, I don't know whether that really answers your question, but I think um, it was a good discussion point. I'm not sure that we can fix it at this point and put targets in. Um, oh, thanks, Wendy. The only thing I'd add would be, and, and I appreciate what's being said here, but it might make sense if there were targets for each source protection area, Beth, as opposed to across the province, because obviously that's not working to give you targets for, for all the reasons you were just saying in the north something and the, you know everything. So for, for, for each source protection region, surely there could be some targets set. I mean, you can do it for all kinds of things in life. Surely we can do it for this. And it's something to work towards and it's something to measure towards. Um, because yeah, yeah. if you don't have targets, believe me, it, it'll just flounder. And how do you really know if you're doing all right? It's been very, oh, yeah, well, I think we're doing good and, and that kind of stuff. There's nothing to measure against. I think we, I think you need to come up with some kind of target. That's personally the way I feel. I think the municipalities do have their own targets. We have 50 municipalities with 50 different targets. 80% um, of the plan policies are implemented by municipalities. And um, I don't think it's realistic for the, the Source Protection Committee to set targets for the municipalities um, because they've set their own targets based on their resources and their capabilities. 
and um, implementing the policies. So I think it's it's a it's a really complex um, region, and that's why um, when I made that presentation to Kirsten, I wanted to really emphasize the urban and the rural and the um, complexities <clears throat> relating to water supply systems and implementation capacities and it just goes on and on and on. But I think we've, there, there is a target. It's, it's not to say there's no target. It's just that it's just not a nice black and white target. And Linda, you had your hand up too. I did, thank you, Madam Chair. I think you kind of hit on some of the points I was gonna make, um, but I also noted, and I think Andrew had a really good point. It was in the chat and I don't know if you saw it, but I, he alluded to the fact that the, the targets that are in the reports are um, a qualitative and not a quantitative. So it makes it very hard to, it, it, it is, becomes a, a very subjective kind of evaluation, but I, I don't know. My my way of looking at it, I, I take a look at what they've done and from an annual perspective and I don't know, I've looked at those reports and, and listened to them talk, but there's been a lot of work done. Bottom line, there's been a lot of work done and, and I think it is a, a revolving target for themselves, for particularly for the Grand and Long Point with things changing all the time. So, and, and looking at it, I, I think in my view, they're progressing well. So I think it's a it's a good it's a good um, qualifier. And then adding those extra points, I think, is very good to be documented um, moving forward. That there's that understanding of all those imp um, things that have come in their way that have prevented them from maybe getting as far as they would have liked to. Okay, thank you. Um, any other comments, questions? I was wondering, um, Ilona, if um, similar to what we did in Long Point, yeah. coming up with the change yeah. percentage, if that percentage could be yes. added. Absolutely. Um, so I for the Grand River, sorry, go ahead. I don't know what it would be, but we can calculate it. Yes, it's actually, for everyone's information, it's 39% for the Grand River um, in addressing significant drinking water threats as opposed to, what was it, 26%? Yeah. So if we use the new calculation, the C plus D divided by A plus B, it's higher at 39%. So we'll include that in our comments as well. That's good, thank you. I saw Andrew had his hand up before, Wendy. Oh, Andrew, go ahead. I, I was only going to elaborate a little bit further. Like the, the intention, as I took it, the intention was supposed to be just a broad statement from the committee to stamp on the report that says, you know, either we're, we're satisfied, we're happy with the progress, we're happy with concerns, we have concerns or we suck. Like those are the four options that we have. Um, it's it's just a it's just a stamp, a very quali high level qualitative stamp. And I don't I don't know that we really need to kind of get into the weeds of setting targets and and all of this stuff uh, on a case by case basis because it could be it could be very different. Like you had like we had mentioned uh, like we mentioned previously. I I'm happy with the with the statements that we provided. I think. Um, I think they make sense, um, especially where we've we've identified falling shorts, largely because of external circumstances and resource issues, and uh, and and just the sheer volume of threats that you have to go through. Uh, I'm I'm satisfied with with what they what they are, and I, I think it could probably could be addressed by the ministry at a at a later date with some clarification or guidance. That's great. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Seeing none, um, can I have a mover to um, receive the report for information and forward it to the appropriate bodies? Bill Strauss, a mover. Thank I'll you, start. Bill. John, John Sapoulis, thank you. All those in favor? Opposed, if any? Carried unanimously, thank you very much. And thank you, Alona, for all your work. It, that's a huge amount of work. And uh, 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and also thank Stuart, who did all the data crunching. He did the hard stuff. Oh, really? Well, thank you very much, Stuart. That's a, that's that's even a tough job too, getting all the uh, the data and getting everybody to get it to you and having it all make sense. So that's good. Um, the next item on the agenda is the business arising from the previous meetings. Uh, you'll see that uh, we did send a letter off to Kirsten Corgill, the new director. And uh, to date, we haven't heard anything back. Do you have any update, Beth? Yes, thanks so much. Um, <clears throat> I believe uh, Kirsten sent a response back in December, just a general like, thank you for for that letter and that we continue to assess the local threat request um but not not like a formal letter response to you oh, okay um, uh yeah um and i'm sorry to say i know this isn't the news that everyone wants to hear but we're continuing to to assess that threat so that has not changed since um since the last time that you met um, with the impending election this spring the timing of a decision is unknown at this point um, but in the meantime, I'll continue to keep all of you apprised of any updates and, and share them with you. Um, I appreciate your patience as we work towards um, getting getting a decision on this request. I know it's been really, really long and you've been you've all been very patient and I know that it's frustrating. I appreciate that. Thanks for the update, Beth. Um, is there any other other business? I just um, noting that the next agenda is June 16th and it's going to be another virtual meeting. Um, there's no closed business to discuss. So may I have a motion to adjourn? So move it, Bill Strauss. Thank you, Bill. A seconder? Paul Emerson? All in favor? Thank you. Um, the meeting is adjourned and Martin will follow up and Ilona with um, seeking uh, resolutions um, that are approved by the full um, quorum on the committee. But I appreciate you um, bringing forward the uh, resolutions today and voting on them, because that gives us a pretty good sense of um, what the questions or comments would be. And I really appreciate that. So having said that, um, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you, Wendy. We will, we will follow up. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.